I'm Sean Delaney, and today on the What Got You There podcast, I sit down with restaurateur Will Gadera to talk all about the climb to becoming the number one restaurant in the world and his new book, Unreasonable Hospitality. This conversation is going to change you. It was one of the most impactful conversations I've ever had on the podcast. And if you want to understand how to connect deeper with people and learn how to lead and learn how to be unreasonable in how you approach hospitality, you will love this conversation with Will Gadera. What Got You There is a podcast for high achievers looking to learn from the most successful people of all time, what their strategies, lessons, and routines are that made them successful. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. Will, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Like, Like I was saying, this is a conversation I've wanted to have for a number of years, Based on your approach, both the business and life, but I would love to start how you start your service each day. And I know you do a pre-service routine that's pretty foundational to, to the success that you guys have had in business. So I would love for you just to dive in. What is the pre-service routine? Yeah, so I, I'm of the belief that what gets talked about most consistently is what defines a culture. What you talk about as a leader is what your team ends up thinking about. Restaurants, almost all restaurants do some sort of pre-service meeting. And you've probably seen it in some movie where a hotel manager kind of like criticizes one of the wait staff for not having perfectly polished shoes. And they talk about a new dish that goes in the menu or they you know, talk about whatever, new wine or health insurance. But for me, pre-service is so much more than that. Um, I believe it's an opportunity and a responsibility the leader has every single day where for the 30 minutes before we open our doors and welcome people into the room, we get together and yes, we go through the things I just talked about, but a majority of the meeting is talking about, to use a Simon Sinek term, our why. Why is the work important? What opportunities do we have? Um, What responsibilities do we have? I'm of the firm belief that in hospitality, we, we do important work. We get to help people celebrate. We get to give them the grace to forget. We can inspire people through our attention to detail or make the world a kinder place by being very kind. And pre-service is an opportunity for me to articulate those things and encourage the team to join the conversation and do the same. I believe that 30 minutes, if every customer service organization in the world did a daily 30 minute huddle before they open their doors, I think it would transform customer service as we know it, because it's when a collection of individuals becomes a trusting team. What does the evolution of that look like over time? Is this something that continues to evolve and strengthen the organization? Or if someone's been involved in the organization for a long time, is it kind of this mundane thing? I'm just wondering how you think about that. Well, I'm going to answer that question in two ways. Um, One of the ways in which it evolves over time is, listen, at 11 Madison Park for the first many, many years I was there, I led pre-service twice a day before lunch and before dinner, five days a week, every single day. Um, Over time, as people had been there long enough where they fully understood the spirit of our collective endeavor, I would invite them to start leading that meeting as well. And so one of the things to stave off that idea that you just spoke to, does it become mundane, is to actually invite people to to take a real sense of ownership in the meeting. But the reality is, is twofold. One, A culture is a living and breathing thing. You don't just set it and forget it. You don't do like 30 amazing pre-service meetings in a row and now everyone gets it and you just do it, right? If you you don't water a plant, it dies. It's the same thing with the culture. But B, I believe in the power of language. I think that too few companies spend the amount of time and are as intentional as they should be in putting words to what they're trying to be in the world and the goals that they're trying to accomplish. And so 
any great organization who understands the power of language, they have their isms, right? Their ideas, their core values, their non-negotiables. And if you have enough of those, by the time you've gone through all of them, it's been quite a bit of time since you talked about the one you reviewed first. And so there is an element of repetition, but a culture grows and evolves. And there's, if you're managing it the right way, always going to be new things that the group needs to turn their attention towards. One of the things, Will, that's coming through is the, the intentionality that you bring forward. And I'm wondering, as, as a leader, what happens those days, right, where you're just a little a little drained? I'm wondering, it's like that second free service. What, what are you doing as a leader to still be intentional, um, even the days that you don't fully have it in the tank? Let's say two things. One, I've found that being together with my team and connecting with them and reviewing the things that make us stand out from the pack. When I don't necessarily feel like I have it in me, that is the thing that sets me straight. Have you ever heard people talk about like when they're hungover, going to the gym is the best thing that they can do. It's what like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's all that dissimilar, honestly. That said, and I talk about this in the book, you need to be self-aware enough to know that if you just don't have the capacity to lead as a leader, that's when you need to put yourself on the bench and let someone else step up and do the job. Um, people crave leadership and it's reasonable for them to expect it consistently. I think being consistent as a leader is one of the most important things you can be. And on the days where you just don't have it in you, you need to give yourself a pass and pass the baton to someone who does. I'm getting a sense of humility here where you, you got to be able to look to those others. How much of a role does humility impact how you go about your craft? I mean, I think that <laughs> once a leader loses their humility, I think it's just a matter of time before they lose their team as mm -hmm. well. And I don't mean that literally people need jobs. They might, stay working there and they might keep on collecting a paycheck. But once you lose your humility, you slowly start to lose people's trust. A better way of saying that is, I think one of the best ways to earn trust is through vulnerability. And I mean, we talk about this all the time in a restaurant. Listen, I believe that a restaurant's entire reason for being is connection. Um, I believe that in a restaurant, and I think this applies to so many other businesses, the food, the service, the design, they're merely ingredients in the recipe of human connection. And we talk about all the time, when you sit down and you start to serve someone, both people walk into the interaction with their walls up. Your role is to try to get people to lower their guards as quickly as possible. I mean, you look at this conversation, we've just met, right? Each one of us, whether it's on a subconscious level or not, has walked into this conversation with our guards up. We're trying to feel each other out. We're trying to get a sense of one another. The more quickly those guards come down, the better this conversation is gonna be, the more connected we're gonna be. One of the best ways to get other people to lower their guard is through vulnerability. If I offer you a piece of me, if I literally open myself, I'm open myself up to attack, Right, I'm showing you that I trust you, your wall comes down more quickly. If that's what we're trying to do in service, it's most decidedly what we're trying to do in leadership. You're trying to let, you're trying to create conditions where your team lets their guard down enough where you can connect with them genuinely because only once the entire team is connected is the collective capacity and creativity unlocked. Once a leader loses humility, they're never gonna be vulnerable anymore. And if they're not gonna open themselves up to their team, how can they ever expect their team to do so in return? Do you have any stories of connection being built with someone who, who, who's been to one of your restaurants or an experience you had where you were a guest at a restaurant? Get, be more specific. I'm just wondering how the restaurant created connection with you or how you as the restaurant had created connection with the guest. Oh, and you mean at the beginning of it all? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so many stories of that where, I mean, one of the things we talk about all the time is that people have a tendency to lean out from tension, 
right? And part of hospitality is having the wherewithal to take the risk of leaning in with tension. Um, Oftentimes when someone comes into any customer service organization and they're just acting like a jerk, people's tendency is to give them worse service, yeah. right? That person no longer deserves my best energies. But unreasonable hospitality is understanding that maybe that person's acting like a jerk because something terrible just happened in their life. And maybe the person that's acting like a jerk actually needs your love and your hospitality more than anyone else in the room. And there's been more than one time where someone, a first time guest who was incredibly problematic, when you leaned all the way in, you actually learned that they just needed some healing. And it's one of the things I love about hospitality is we have a capacity to heal just through graciousness and thoughtfulness. We had one guest who came in um, single diner at the bar, the bartender came up to me and said, this guy, he's got to go. He is being the biggest jerk. Like I can't deal with him. And by the way, there's a fine line here because abuse in customer service organizations ultimately can't be tolerated, but I always like to give it a shot before we get there. Mm -hmm. And I just went out there and just kept on talking to him. And ultimately slowly, like an onion layer upon layer upon layer came out off until he told me what had just happened in his life. And rather than kick him out of the restaurant, we bought him a glass of champagne and that guy turned out to be one of our biggest regulars. He had just gotten divorced that day. He signed his divorce papers. He was going because he needed a drink and he was spewing the negativity of his day onto other people, which is a natural human tendency as unhealthy as it is. And rather than us responding in kind, we responded with love. And it turned what could have been a terrible day for him into a slightly less terrible day. And he became a part of our family from that point forward. What has become apparent for me about you through your, your talks, your book, is the love you have for your craft. Hmm. And I'm wondering, when you first realized that you had fallen in love with hospitality? You know, it's an interesting question because I fell in love with restaurants when I was a kid. My dad was in the restaurant business. My dad was my hero. I always wanted to be like him. It didn't matter what he did for a living. That's the thing I would have wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, but restaurant people work long hours. If you're a kid, you love your dad, you wanna spend time with him, you have to go to work with him. And over the years, as I would go to work with him and he'd drop me off with a server in the dining room or one of the cooks in the kitchen, I started falling in love with restaurants, not just because he did that for a living, but because I was enchanted by the energy that existed in those rooms, the sense of camaraderie, the creativity, all of that. Like there was a magic there that I just hadn't felt anywhere else. And, and we went to this restaurant called the Four Seasons in New York for my birthday when I was 12 years old. And that was the, the, the full clicking point for me where I don't remember much about that meal, honestly, but I remember the way it made me feel. There's this quote, I believe it's the best one about hospitality often attributed to Maya Angelou. It's people will forget what you say, they'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that was most certainly the case that night because for a few hours in that room, the entire world fell away. It was almost like the rest of the world was put on pause and all that was left was me and my dad at that table. And at the end of it, not only did I feel closer to him than I ever had, but I knew what I wanted to do with my life, which was to go into restaurants. Now, I'm giving you a long-winded answer, but with intention. I was in love with restaurants for these, for the idea that you could create a magical world in a world that needed more magic. It was later, and I don't know when, I can't put my finger on it, that I fell in love with hospitality and realized that I was in the hospitality business and restaurants just happened to be the way in which I was able to do that. Um, at some point along the line, I just fully connected with the idea that there is nothing better, more energizing, more positive that feels better than just when you see the look of complete joy on someone's face when they receive a gift that you're responsible for giving them. 
Um, that is my oxygen. And it's pretty cool when people always talk about like how to steer clear of burnout or depleting yourself through working too hard. When you can stumble upon a career where the thing that you do is what energizes you such that you don't burn out while you're doing it, it's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, it's the, the only sustainable fuel source. Right. Like Nietzsche said it when, when you know your why you can endure anyhow. And it's that, it's that love for it, the craft. One thing you said a minute ago that I think changed the way I probably think about business. And this was from seeing talks you did years ago. And it's around creating magic. I think so often we think, all right, we're going to go to a restaurant. They're going to serve us. It's, it's going to be this transactional thing. You have countless stories of ways you've created magic. For someone who's who, who's come to dine at one of your restaurants and i'm hoping people even outside hospitality can think about this and how they approach their customers i would love if you could bring to light a story of how you created magic for someone who's come to one of your restaurants yeah so i mean the background here is i was dead set on having the number one restaurant in the world and i recognized that the idea of having a restaurant that is the best restaurant in the world is insane, right? That's, that's not a real thing. Um, what that list acknowledges is the restaurant that's having the greatest impact on the world of food. Every restaurant that topped that list before we did, did so because they had revolutionized what was on the plate, the thing that they were serving people. And they had been unreasonable in pursuit of whatever it was that they were serving. And I saw an opportunity for us to be just as unreasonable, not just about what we were serving, but about how we were making people feel along the way. And we started these years long conversations about like, what is the most unreasonable way to make people feel a sense of belonging? And then one day I was in the dining room on a busier than normal lunch service when um, I found myself clearing appetizers from a table of four foodies who were on vacation in New York on their way to the airport to go back home after their lunch. And I ever heard them talking and they were talking about the amazing trip and they were talking about all the amazing restaurants they went to. And then one of them said, yeah, but we never had a hot dog from a street cart. Hmm. And it was like one of those cartoon moments um, where the light bulb goes off over the character's head. And I went back into the kitchen, dropped off the plates and then literally ran outside the hot dog cart, bought a hot dog, brought it back inside, somehow convinced the chef to serve it in our fancy four-star restaurant. We cut it up into four pieces, made it look beautiful with like a little swish of ketchup and mustard. And before their final savory course, which was a honey lavender glazed duck that had been dry aged for two weeks, I brought over their dirty water hot dog. <laughs> and explained it and I said, hey, I wanna make sure you don't go home with any culinary regrets. And they freaked out. I'd served thousands and thousands of plates of food, lobster, caviar, Wagyu beef, everything and I'd never seen anyone react the way that they did to the $2 hot dog. And so we, we hired a new position on the team called Dreamweaver, just so that our entire team could start coming up with more ideas like that hot dog and have the resources in a person whose only responsibility was to help them bring those ideas to life. Mm -hmm. And we did thousands of things like that in the years that followed. Um, There's a family of four on vacation from Spain in the restaurant. We watched as the most beautiful thing happened because the kids were looking at our massive windows with wonder because it started snowing and it was the first time they'd seen snow. The Dreamweaver somehow found a store still open at eight o'clock on a Friday night selling sleds. And when they finished their meal and they walked outside, we had an SUV with the sleds to take them to Central Park to go sledding. Um, or a couple came in after their beach vacation flight was canceled and you know, they were excited to be in our restaurant, but pretty bummed they weren't on their way to Turks and Caicos. So at the end of their meal, we turned our private dining room into a private beach. We put a bunch of sand on the ground and put a kiddie pool filled with water in there and those folding chairs and served them Mai Tais. And here's the thing. And, and, and by the way, that became the defining element of our restaurant was we were completely unreasonable and going above and beyond and serving people the kind of hospitality where one size fit one. 
the kind of gestures that wouldn't make sense if they were served to anyone else but the ones receiving them. Um, we did it through being present, just caring so much of the, about the people we were serving that we stopped caring about all the other stuff we needed to do. We did it through taking what we did seriously, but not taking ourselves so seriously that we let some self-imposed standards get in the way of us giving the people we were serving the things that would make them the most happy. And the result was that the guests were obviously happy. That was the, the reason we started it. But the cool thing was that our team was happier than ever before. Hmm. Because for the first time, everyone in the dining room wasn't just serving plates of food that someone else had created. They were coming up with their own ideas and those ideas were directly impacting the guest experience. We had taken salespeople and turned them into product designers. And I've not met a single person in my life who won't give more of themselves to make an experience great once they've had the opportunity to help craft that experience. But then, like I was saying before, we were also just happier because we were making other people really happy. And I've come to learn in an interview I did recently that that's a scientific thing about the release of oxytocin that, I mean, when you even hear a story about someone bestowing unreasonable graciousness upon another person, it puts you in a better mood. Forget about whether you're the person actually delivering that act of graciousness and you get to see the look on the person's face when they receive it. And that's ultimately the thing that was responsible for our success. I mean, I, I, I'm getting chills hearing these stories and what, what stands out so much to me is we each have these opportunities, no matter what we do, right? Like as Carlos Castaneda said, we have the, these cubic centimeters of chance. You guys are attuned to those. And you see that opportunity where the, that couple or that family of four is sitting there and the kids are looking out at the, at the snow coming down. And it's just this approach, this intentionality, the word you've said again and again. Um, you, have, you have this line in your book that I just loved. It hits on this. It says, we got on that 50 best list by pursuing excellence, the black and white, attending to every detail and getting as close to perfection as we could. But we got to number one by going technicolor, by offering hospitality so bespoke, so over the top, it can be described only as unreasonable. So I hope everyone listening is hearing that and saying, how can I be unreasonable in my craft, in my business? But Will, I, I would love to hear the backstory and the pursuit of number one. And I would like to, to hear the story of the first year you were invited. <laughs> you know the story I'm about to tell. It's a good one, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so we... Listen, in New York, we were kind of on top of the world, right? Like we had gotten all the accolades, and the James Beard Awards, for, for those of you who don't know what those are, that's like the restaurant world's equivalent to the Oscars. And, um, we had all the stars. And, and then one day we got a letter in the mail that said, you've been added to the, to the 50 best restaurants in the world. Um, went to London, threw on a tuxedo, went to the ceremony. The way that ceremony works is if you're in the room, you know you're in the top 50. You just don't know where in the list you fall until the ceremony starts. They start at 50 and they count down all the way to one. So it's kind of actually like the Academy Awards with the distinction that you are praying they don't call your name for as long as humanly possible. <laughs> um, and we sit down, there's a sign seating and I'm looking around at where I'm sitting relative to where like my heroes are sitting. These are the best chefs and restaurateurs in the world. I know who almost all of them are, um, I guessed 35. My, my partner, I was a bit more optimistic, guessed 24. And then the thing started, and I'm sure there was some preamble before they kicked it off, but all I really remember is them saying, and kicking it off at number 50, a new entry from New York City, 11 Madison Park. And my gosh, man, I like, I bowled over my head and my knees, like I just kicked in the groin. <laughs> now, what I couldn't have known at the time was, and it was our first year there and we we're the first restaurant called was the reason they give you a signed seating has nothing to do with where on the list you fall. It's just that they know where to train the camera after they announce your name so they can project your image in front of the entire, you know, arena. And it's when everyone else would like muster up a smile and wave no matter whether they were happy or not with their position, except we weren't smiling or waving. Um, I did what any 
proper person would do in a moment of profound disappointment. I left the party early, went back yeah. to the hotel, grabbed a bottle of whiskey from behind the bar, and started <laughs> drinking, um, going through the stages of grief. Uh, lots of time spent on anger. Still not quite sure I understand what bargaining is, but ultimately we got to acceptance. Because here is the deal, and, it, and the, the, the part you just read out of the book. This is what I was trying to articulate there. We were a great restaurant. We were good at what we did, but we had not yet made an impact. You know, there's a restaurant in Spain called El Bulli that pioneered this thing called molecular gastronomy or one in Copenhagen that pioneered like local foraging. We were awesome, but we hadn't done any of that. When I was a kid, my dad gave me this paperweight and on it, um, it said, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? And he always pushed me to answer that question honestly, telling me that so many people won't for fear that, you know, most people's honest answer is quite audacious. And if they say it out loud and don't achieve it, they'll let themselves and those around them down. But his whole thing was, hey, answer it honestly and try, and maybe you don't succeed, but you'll A, get a whole lot further down the road for having tried and B, well, what's the alternative? You don't try to accomplish the thing you want most. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were thinking that night when on a little crumpled cocktail napkin, I wrote, we will be number one in the world. But I wanted it for the accolade, but also for the impact. And ultimately at the end of that night, figured out the impact I believed we could have because while those other chefs had topped that list by focusing on when, what needed to change, I wanted our impact to come by focusing on the one thing that would never change, which is the human desire to be cared for. If they were unreasonable, I wanted to be unreasonable too. And so I wrote two words under that on the cocktail napkin, unreasonable hospitality. And that became our call to arms. How do you as a leader, because the success continued for you guys, I know you were, you were dabbling in the, in the top five and top 10 multiple years. I think it was number four, number five, back and forth. How, how do you manage the team when you get so close to this goal you've been working for for so long, but just not quite there? What does that look like behind the scenes? So you'll find I quote my dad often. Um, one of his other quotes that I love is adversity is a terrible thing to waste. You can't control entirely what happens to you, but you can control how you react. And oftentimes, I wanted to say about a leader, the moment you lose your humility, you, you start down the path of losing the trust of your team. That same concept applies to the organization as a whole. Once an organization loses its, its humility, it starts down the path of losing the trust of its entire community. Unbridled, consistent success and humility are not friends. Hmm. Um, and so stumbles along the way aren't the worst thing even if they feel like they're the worst thing in the moment. I think in moments of adversity, you can restore a competitive spirit. You can go back to being the underdog, which is when most people do their best work. Um, it can inspire creativity because there's nothing, there are very few seasons in life when you're more creative than when you feel like your back is up against the wall. Now, to be clear, and this is important, I'm not the kind of person that like when something bad happens, I'm like, all right, guys, this is great. Let's learn from it. Let's grow. I don't think that's healthy. I believe like there was a year when we'd gone up every single year. And then one year we went down a spot and that was devastating. It was the first year we'd like lost our momentum. And I said to the team, hey, because sometimes the team just needs to hear from their leader that their leader is sad too. And it gives everyone a bit more comfort in the fact that they're sad. Sometimes you just need to give yourself fully to whatever feeling you're feeling, indulge it, let it wash over you. 
and then wake up the next morning and get back to work. And sometimes when things don't go your way, it's not fair. Most times when things don't go your way, there's something you can learn for it, from it. And there's a reason why. And if you can get over yourself and stop pretending that everyone else is wrong, but maybe there's something that you can learn from whatever the situation is, oftentimes it's an opportunity for growth. Hmm. Will you, you talk about adversity. Adversity is something you, you experienced a lot growing up and grew, grew to know. And, and one of the things I look for in my guests is well, I need to be just where I have to have this conversation because they put me through the total human experience. They, they inspire me. They awe me. They, they make me just like get chills. And you did that um, because of a story with your mom. Um, and you did this incredible talk, which I'm going to link to, which was from the Welcome Conference uh, a few years ago. And there was three lessons. Um, and I'll go through those quickly because you just hit on one of them. You can talk things into existence, which is an incredible line I love from Jay-Z's book as well. The power of nonverbal communication and what we were just talking about, adversity is a terrible thing to waste. Can you just tell the backstory um, with your mom and talking things into existence? Because this is one of the most impactful stories I've ever heard. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. And a hundred percent, I, I love talking about my mom. Um, my mom and my dad were both in hospitality. My mom was a flight attendant for American Airlines. My dad um, had run a variety of restaurant companies. Um, and when I was about four, my mother was working in first class and she was very good at what she did. And over the course of a month or so, she kept on dropping stuff in first class to the point that it became alarming. And I went to see a doctor, which ultimately led to her being diagnosed with brain cancer. It was a malignant tumor, which means that it wasn't like a, a golf ball, easy to remove in its entirety. It had, you know, had little fingers kind of, and so they remove as much as they can from your brain. And then they used radiation treatment to kill what remained. Now the problem was radiation treatment back then was not nearly as refined as it is now. And so where right after the surgery, my mom still had use of one of her legs and one of her arms and could talk and get around and still drive. Um, in the years that followed, her physical condition deteriorated to the point that she was rendered into a quadriplegic, um, unable to move at all and hardly able to talk by the end. Now, this was when I was four and what I would come to find out later in life is that the doctors didn't believe she would live longer than another six, seven, eight years. Now, my mom loved me recklessly. My mother lost her parents when she was a kid. She never had like a strong family unit after that. And when she had me, it was like her biggest dream in the world finally come true. She had a family. I actually joke sometimes that she loved me so much. Had it not been for her sickness, I don't know how long my dad and her would have stayed together, but she definitely loved me a lot more than she loved him. <laughs> um, When I talk about nonverbal communication, what I was talking about was even though she couldn't talk, the way that she smiled at me showed me so clearly that it was not possible to be loved more than she loved me. But she loved me so much that I became her reason to live. And she decided at some point along the way, she never told this to me directly because I think everyone wanted to shield me from the fact that she might not live all that long, that she was going to see me graduate college. And a woman that was told by doctors she should live until I was about 12 just kept living and living and living and living. Um, she and my dad were meant to come to my graduation at Cornell and had like hired a medical van and like did all the training to figure out how to get up there for it. Um, but two days before my graduation, she slipped into a coma. And I graduated, threw my hat in the air like one does ran to my car, jumped in the car, drove from Ithaca, New York to Boston, where they lived at the time. 
straight to her hospital. My dad had already gone home for the night. I sat in a chair next to her hospital bed and fell asleep on her lap. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and she was awake. And this woman with whom I had not had a proper conversation in years was able to talk fluently. And we had a full conversation. She said, you graduated? And I said, yeah. And she goes, how was it? I told her all about it. And then she ultimately slipped back into a coma. Um, I went to get the doctors, da 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 She passed away that night. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? Jay-Z is, I believe you can talk things into existence. I mean, I know that's true because of her. Um, and it's important to lean in to the one word because she would say that out loud to my dad, I will see him graduate. Talking things into existence means saying them out loud. Because if you don't have the conviction to say something out loud over and over and over again, you're not gonna accomplish it. People, it's ridiculous. People say like, no, I don't want to jinx it. It's like, no, you need to manifest it. Um, it doesn't mean it'll always happen. But at the very least you can know and believe that you gave it every ounce of your being. Thank you for sharing that. That is, uh, I'm, I'm getting emotional. You, you tell them that I'm, I'm just happy. I didn't, I didn't break down here because that, that, that moves people, that story. So I just appreciate you sharing that. And, and I would love if you could share another story around moments of connection. And this is actually with a past guest we had on someone who went above and beyond and created some serious connection with me as well. And that's chef Danielle Baloud. Hmm. And, and you have a very powerful story in the book. Uh, I would just love if, if you would share. Yeah. So Danielle, who he's amazing. I mean, he, obviously an extraordinarily talented chef, but as you'll come to see in the story, just one of the most kind people in our industry who has always taken the time to invest in those that have nothing to offer in, re in return. That's how you know someone's actually genuinely gracious when they're not only giving gifts to people who can turn around and give them right back. Um, so there was a class at Cornell called Guest Chefs where famous chefs would come up and um, do a dinner and the, the students would either cook or serve and you know it was like a whole kind of like playing restaurant kind of thing. I took the class when Daniel Balud came up and I was in charge of marketing that dinner, which was a very easy job because he was the most famous chef that came up over the course of several years, it required no marketing whatsoever. And so I decided that my role was actually to entertain him and his sous chefs. Um, his sous chefs came up before he did and I took them out for a fun night. And by the end of that first night, I, I, was, I was their people. Um, and I mean, there's a lesson in there. It wasn't diabolical that, you know, take care of, if you want to like connect with the leader, take care of their people. And if they're the right kind of leader, they're going to be inclined to want to take care of you. Um, so the dinner went great, obviously, it was Daniel Balud. And afterwards I was like, all right, Danielle, let's go. Like, we're having a fun night now. And so I took him to a couple of bars and then I invited a, you know, 150 of my closest friends over to my house and we threw a giant keg party for Daniel Balud. Um, he and I actually, we were having a couple of beers and he was like, Willie, let's go back to the hotel. So we go back to the hotel, break into the kitchen, take pots, pans, eggs, truffles, caviar. We go back to my house on 130 College Avenue and Daniel Balud starts cooking for every single person at the party. Um, it was a really, really special night. And he said, hey, like, you showed me amazing hospitality. Let me know when you're in New York City. I wanna, I wanna return the favor at Restaurant Danielle, which is his flagship restaurant. This was my senior year of, high, of college. I was told my mom passed away a few, you know, a day later. Um, after college, I went to Spain and my dad, this is two weeks after my mother passed away, my dad drove me to the city to catch my flight to Spain. 
And I figured, you know what? Let me see if Danielle was serious about that invitation. And so I emailed him and asked him if we could come in and he invited me and my dad to go to the restaurant. We walked in, went through the bar, through the dining room, into the kitchen. And there's this table at Danielle in this glass office that overlooks the kitchen. It's called the Skybox. It's the most VIP of VIP tables. And here I was a college kid. And he invited me and sat me at that table, served us the most ridiculous 16 course tasting menu. He spieled every single dish at the end of the night. We were the last three people there, me my dad and Danielle, not the three last guests, the three last staff. Danielle stayed after everyone in the restaurant, including his own team had left so that he could see us off. Um, gave us a tour, there was no check, he comped it. Mm -hmm. And the reason that story was such an important part of my journey, again, it's just a cool story to party with Danielle, obviously. <laughs> but it was much more than that. I talk about how no matter what you do, you need to dig deep and find the words that articulate why your work matters. Because if you're trying to be the best at anything, there are gonna be hard days. And if you don't have that reserve to tap into, the thing that reminds me, that reminds you, you have the capacity to, to impact the world around you through just being good at what you do, you're gonna have a hard time being great on those days. I always believed that in hospitality, there was nobility because we could help people celebrate some of the most important moments of their lives. And that's significant. But that night I learned for the first time, I mean, I don't, I've never been as sad in my life as I was then. I just lost my mother. And yet, Danielle, through his hospitality, same as the Four Seasons, put the world on pause and gave my dad three of the best hours of our lives. Maybe that is when I knew I wanted to be in the hospitality business. Maybe that's when it became hospitality from restaurants. Did you always have this, this approach to exceptionalism and excellence? And th these are my words I'm putting out there because the, you're, you're at those levels that are so much deeper. You're at the, the ones that are like trying to tap greatness with how you think about this. And I'm wondering when you, when you realized that. That's very kind of you to say. Um, I don't know. I'm, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, listen. My dad is a pretty excellence focused person. <laughs> um, I definitely have a lot of OCD tendencies. I think my collection of experiences with him as a role model with my mother and her situation, learning how to receive love and how to take care of her and others. It's funny, I have, a, I have an 18 month old daughter now named Frankie, I named her after my dad. And I'm so interested in, well, the personality she already has and how it will develop from here, how much of it is my wife, how much of it is me, how much of it is her experience, how much of it is just the unique individual that's inside of her. Um, so I'm sure parts of who I am, I've always been. Parts of who I am, I learned from the mentors that I've had along the way. And I also, listen, I've had some misfortune, but I'm a very fortunate person and I've gotten to befriend and learn from some remarkable people. And I think in learning, in being on the receiving end so many times of profound hospitality, once you understand how good it feels to receive, you're inclined to want to get really good at giving it to. And then this approach to craft, this is a continual evolving. And I'm saying that because you've done that. You, you've taken action where the, the reconstruction of 11 Madison Park, 
it, it makes me think of Tiger Woods in the, in the height of his prime. He completely essentially took 18 months off to deconstruct and reconstruct his swing. And I'm wondering how that mindset for you around, even when we're exceptional, this isn't enough. How, how do you ingrain that in your, in your company where complacency could be so easy? I just think the journey is more fun than the destination. Why? I mean, think of it like a road trip. You, you go on a road trip because you like being on the road trip, not because you're excited to like get to the other side of the country. I think when you love what you do, you want to keep the ride going. You know, like, I also think, forget about the fun, just focus on the feeling. My wife is a famous pastry chef and there's cookies and cakes and pies in my world all the time. And there are seasons where I'll slip and I'll eat way too many of them and I'll gain a bunch of weight and then I'll have to go on a diet to lose all of it again. Um, it's much more fun losing weight for me than maintaining weight. Because at least if I'm going to eat healthy, at least I want the positive feeling of progress while I'm doing it, you know? <laughs> I just think there are a few things that feel better. And those are two very different metaphors. There's elements of each of them that apply to what I'm talking about. If you love what you do, the affirmation of waking up every day and finding that you're doing it a little bit better than you did the day before is a pretty beautiful feeling. And what's the alternative? One day you're just done? You're as good as you can be? Then do something else at that point. Or retire. <laughs> You, I mean, you just you just tap into one of those things that that's so obvious, but so many don't go towards. So I love having exemplars like yourself who were able to who who've carved the path and found that thing that just like follow, Joseph Campbell, so you're following your bliss. Hmm. I'm wondering when you were 12 or 13, did you have any expectation that this would have taken place? Everything you've done over the years. Well, my dad, in his inherent wisdom and intensity when I was 12, asked me to come up with a to-do list for life, my life to-do list. Uh, he gave it to me a while back, and so I have proof of this. I don't remember doing it, but in my handwriting at 12. What are your three goals in life? Will, what are your three goals in life? And one was to go to Cornell, two was to open a restaurant in New York City, and three was to marry Cindy Crawford. <laughs> And so I got, I got two out of the three and on the third, I think it might have been better. And so, yeah, I knew what I wanted to do. I'm lucky in that way, right? Like that's what you talk about, like the moments where you feel blessed. I feel blessed that I was able to find my bliss, to use your words, very, very early. And that gave me a head start. Um, it also has just given me more years to do the thing I love doing. I had no concept of the level I would end up doing it at. There was never even a fleeting thought when I was 12, like I'm gonna be the best in the world at this. You know, like I just wanted to be in the game. I, I wanna somewhat segue here because you were bringing this up earlier around the culture and the approach to, to what you do. And I'm wondering through your eyes, what are you looking for? when you're trying to bring someone onto the team and into that culture, what stands out for you? And obviously this, I'm not looking for like our, the surface level, like, yeah, like there, there's things you're seeing as a true artist and understander that probably stand out to you that wouldn't to other people. And I'm hoping we can explore that. You know, this is not a question that I have like a sound bite of an answer to because I, I approach an interview the same as I do a first date. Um, 
I, I talk to leaders who like have this list, all right, I need someone that's this, 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 and this. And we all have those friends that have the list of things they need their future wife or husband to be. And those are the friends that end up single way too long in life. They find love the moment they recognize that they need to stop trying to check things off a list. And instead they just need to find the person that they feel a connection to. Mm -hmm. Someone with integrity that they can trust, that has some passion, that they want to pass the seasons with. Um, that's how I approach an interview. For me, it's just, are you a good person? Are you gonna bring some passion into my life? Can I trust you? Are you gonna work hard? Great. Because honestly, in customer service, which is a good chunk of our economy, the rest of it's not that hard to teach. Thinking about things that aren't that hard to teach, we, we've talked about some of the, the big things that you guys have done, becoming best in the world. There, there is a thing that happened to you that was so small, and there's these opportunities for leaders to have this type of impact, and this is why I want to highlight this. So one of your mentors, Danny Meyer, who's an incredible restaurateur, he did a small gesture with touching you on the shoulder mm. and saying something, and I would love if you tell this story because I've had those moments where someone I look up to did the smallest gesture that I think about 25 years later. And I would love for you to share this story. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's one aside, my dad taught me when I was a kid to just keep a journal. Um, and then he really reinforced my need to keep a journal once I started working. Based on the idea that uh, perspective has an expiration date, mm -hmm. that you can only see the world through the lens of a server while you're a server and for a few months after you become a manager and then the same once you become a general manager and the same once you become an owner, right? Like once you're an owner, it's impossible to fully tap into the perspective you had when you were a server. But if you can memorialize perspective then you can tap into it at least to some extent later in your career and it makes you more empathetic and more effective. Mm -hmm. um, Danny Meyer was my first boss, one of my biggest mentors. I mean, he is everything, he's amazing. Danny Meyer's approach to hospitality is the foundation upon which I've built mine. And I was working at Tabla which was his Indian American restaurant uh, that he opened with Chef Floyd Cardoz. And I was there right after 9-11 and Tabla was struggling. And so every penny counted there. And the walls of Tabla were so beautifully painted, but they employed one of the things that I would never ever allow any one of my friends to do if they were opening a restaurant, which is complicated painting techniques. <laughs> Because here's the deal, in a restaurant, walls chip. And if you have to call in some expensive painter every time a wall chips, that's a really great way to make sure you don't make money. And we couldn't afford to bring that guy back in. So I went to, they were like this green sponge painted type thing. I went to the Home Depot, bought like four little cans of green paint, what I imagined it was, got some sponges. And by the way, this was even before you could just go on YouTube and learn how to do anything. <laughs> I was trying to figure it out. Man. And on a Saturday, we weren't open for lunch. I went in early and I just started trying to fix all the walls. And Danny, for whatever reason, was walking through and we didn't know each other very well yet. I mean, he was my boss, but my boss is boss is boss. And he just stopped, turned around, like put his hand on my side, looked at me in the eyes and said, thank you. And that coming from him, the affirmation, the recognition that I was going above and beyond and that he saw it. Man, the impact it had on me. I mean, that put fuel in the fire for months and I mean, the, the Maya Angelou quote, like I'll never forget how that made me feel. I might've forgotten the story had I not put it in my journal. Um, and it's reminded me later in life when I ended up in the role for others that he 
played for me then. The remarkable power of just taking a moment and showing someone that you see them and you appreciate them. Thank you for sharing that because I think we all play a role where we can do that for someone else. Um, and the impact, the lasting impact that that can have is just so important. Will, your stories, your advice on hospitality, leadership, approach to excellence and craft, uh, I love, I'm obsessed with, which uh, is why I'm so excited to have this conversation. And I would love to connect the listeners with your book where you encapsulate so much of this. Um, so can you just share a few more words about the book? Um, we'll have everything linked up so you guys can find it in the show notes here, but I just definitely want to talk about it. Yeah, so the book is called Unreasonable Hospitality, The Remarkable Power of Giving People More Than They Expect. And it's my book of lessons about service and leadership. All the ones I've learned over the decades I've spent in the hospitality industry. And it's not just for restaurant people. It's not just for hotel people. I think it's a strategy that can become a winning strategy for people in really any industry. It's yeah. me inviting people to do two things. One, regardless what business you're in, make the choice to be in the hospitality industry and choose to be just a bit more unreasonable, perhaps as unreasonable as you are in pursuit of the thing that you make and be just a bit more unreasonable in how you make the people around you feel. Will, that's incredible. It, it's a book I can't recommend highly enough. And you guys know how many books I go through. Um, so check it out in the show notes. Will, one final one for you. If you could do this long form conversation, sit down with anyone dead or alive, who would you love to have a deep dive conversation with? Huh. I mean, I'm, I'm right now in this moment, I'm experiencing a mild obsession with Matthew McConaughey because I just uh, looked at his book on tape. I saw, I saw your I'm post about that. Excited. And so I would, I'd say it'd be McConaughey or my mom or uh, I'd like to get into the head of Elvis Presley. Hmm. I'd like to understand him. I watched the Elvis movie recently and I thought it was pretty awesome. But yeah, McConaughey. <laughs> well, Will, thank you so much for this conversation that is going to have tremendous impact because it did on me. I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. <laughs>